Welcome to our final episode of the semester season with Clutch Time. I'm Jeremy Culver. And I'm Carl Farron. Many sports here at QU have been participating in postseason play, so let's get to some Hawk Talk. The men's volleyball, men's tennis, and women's tennis teams all played in their conference tournaments this past weekend. All teams, unfortunately, did not make it past the first round. With a look back at the season and the tournament, how do you think the seasons went this year? Well, we've been talking about volleyball all season, and you and I both kind of agreed that their overall record looks good, and their overall record puts them fourth in their conference, but their conference record leaves them you know, it's questionable because they were last in the conference and they were 1-11 and they lost in three straight games to Lewis University on Friday. Yeah, they did not seem to put up a big effort in the fight. Uh, I know that they had some errors that ended up being really costly to them, uh, but they ended up losing in three sets, as you said, with 25-16, 25-10, and 25-16 again. So uh, the, ga the games might have been competitive, but their costly errors ended up pushing them over to where they couldn't come back from it. Yeah, I think uh, Lewis just wanted it a little more in the postseason because during the season, the Hawks, they lost a lot of games, but they were really close, like games that were 25 to 23, all three games. And this, they kind of, you know, they lost by 10 points. So uh, I think since I interviewed uh, Coach Foster earlier, he's going to be pretty disappointed, you know, that they lost by so much but they're going to be looking forward to the next season because they have a lot of work to do because they're losing nine seniors. Yeah, they have to replace a lot of seniority on their team. Another look, let's look at the tennis teams. Uh, both of the men's and women's lost in five straight sets for theirs um, with the best to go to five. Uh, men played the number 32 nationally ranked University of Southern Indiana, while the women's played number one ranked in the conference, Lewis University. Uh, to be honest, those games were also complete blowouts. The closest match was Leslie Gaynor and Allison Callahan in a doubles that lost 8-6. Yeah, I think um, the tennis team has kind of been like that. They've, they've won a lot of tough battles, but the ones that they lost, it seemed that they kind of got blown out. Now, Coach Latour said earlier that their goal was to make it to the conference tournament, which they did, so they just need to keep working on moving forward. Yeah, it's true. Q football is now moving from the NAI level to the D2 college level. The program has also restructured their coaching staff with many new additions. The entire team has new ambitions. What do you think the team needs to focus on in the upcoming season? I think one thing is, it's been a quote that a lot of teams say, defense wins championships, and they really need to figure out their defense. Last year they gave up 30.3 points per game, which, to, if you're going to try and win, giving up 30-plus points a game on an average is not going to help you out. They also gave up an average of 148.8 yards per game, where they could only average 62 yards of their, on their own offense. Um, the average plays they gave up were 5.2 yards. They just did not seem to be able to stop consistently a team. They were very unorganized, but I think the new coaching staff with their new business-like and strict policies are going to bring that together because, you know, you just named all these low points in the defense, but we have high points like uh, freshman Dan Camp, who was an All-American linebacker. But something that I want to question is they're restructuring their program. They're moving guys around. Dan Camp, for instance, is no longer a linebacker. He's going to be a safety, I believe. Whoa, so he's going to move from a linebacker position to a safety. That's one question that might need to be answered is, what is the motivation behind this? Do they feel he's going to be a better safety than he was at linebacker? Because as you said, he was an All-American. Right. So that's going to be a big question. Another one thing that's going to be a big answer is replacing Bobby Brennison. Uh, he was you know, a very good quarterback that filled in for us for two years. Really good with getting our offense going, especially last year, going from an 0-11 season to winning at least four games last year. Uh, so trying to replace him is going to be a big issue. Who's going to actually step up in the team that we already have? Well, I think the one guy that 
you know, that is going to replace him, you know, we not, might not have him, but we have three talented quarterbacks that are fighting for a, you know, a starting position. So there's going to be a lot of competition there. Now, are they going to be Bobby Brennison? We don't know. But there's definitely going to be a lot of competition to be the best quarterback to start. And we've seen a lot of the young guys really taking upon themselves to improve on their skills, especially uh, we see them outside already lifting weights and getting out and building that team karamity that could end up being beneficial in the end. Most definitely. Last episode, we talked about the NBA playoffs. This time, let's talk about the NHL. The first round is almost over, so let's take a look into the second round. Los Angeles knocked out number one seed Vancouver in five games and will play against St. Louis. Looking at all of the other games, how do you see the second round playing out? Well, in the West, you know, I'm not going to lie, I'm a St. Louis Blues fan, and I actually think the way the West played out, it's in our favor. Now, we're going to be playing the Kings, which is probably going to be the toughest out of either ending up playing Vancouver or Phoenix later because the Kings, they, are, they have a lot of momentum, and uh, we've had some trouble with them in the past. But I still, you know, not just being a fan, I think that the tournament has played out that we will, that they're in a great spot for the Blues just to keep going on that run that they've had all season. And the East, the East is still going on. There are still three games that need to be determined. And I think that the Rangers, they will pull off their victory and move on as the number one seed. But the big upset will be Washington over Boston. I think Washington is coming back around and Ovechkin is definitely getting his confidence and game back. Yeah, I really think Washington is going to take Boston in the East, but I think that Ottawa is actually going to take New York because one of the best goalies that have been playing in this playoffs is Ottawa's goalie. They've New York has had really no answer to consistently do against him. I know the series is tied 3-3, so obviously they've gotten some wins out of it, but he's stopped a lot of great saves, and I think he's going to pull it out again tonight. Uh, unfortunately, last night I got to witness my Blackhawks lose and get knocked out by Phoenix. Uh, but I do, it could be a personal agenda, but I actually think the LA Kings are the hot team in the NHL. Uh, especially when you can go in and knock out the Vancouver Canucks, who Vancouver has been a great team in the playoffs consistently year to year. I think L.A. might have a run and might end up either you know, pushing that, the St. Louis to seven games or potentially just overtaking them. I, like, I, I do agree with you. Like I said earlier, L.A. does have a lot of momentum because going into the playoffs, the one team I was afraid to have my Blues play was Vancouver, and Vancouver's out now, but now we have to play the team that beat them. Yeah, and that's going to be a tough thing for to see how St. Louis can react to a team that they were bad matched up against and now another team that is just as badly matched up against too. Ozzie Gillen, longtime manager of the Chicago White Sox, has been known for his outlandish public comments. This year is his first season with the Florida Marlins and he has started his Florida career with another controversial remark. He has recently recorded in an interview to viewing Fidel Castro in a positive light and having said, I love Fidel Castro. Gillen served a five-game suspension and later apologized for his comments. Do you think Gillen's punishment was just? You get what you pay for. Uh, I mean, it's, it's been known throughout the league, Ozzie Gillen is the most you know, first outspoken manager out there. And Miami knew ahead of time who they were getting. Uh, so this event, in my opinion, was to be seen. Now, for him to say that he loved Fidel Castro, I don't think anyone ever expected that to happen, especially when Miami is such a Cuban-American dominated market. But I think his, uh, his contexts were taken out badly. Um, I mean, he really, he even said later on in a press conference where he spoke the entire press conference in Spanish, which is his first language, that he's easier, it's easier for him to express things in a Spanish uh, you know, act language rather than trying to speak in a, the English language. And he just got his opinion out differently in the English language that he would have been able to better speak in a, 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 his Right. Language. I actually agree because something was lost in the translation. He doesn't love Fidel Castro and his policies and everything. He wanted to clarify that he admires somebody who has been in power so long, even though there are so many people that wanted him out and even dead. And so he's just admiring that he was able to succeed at that. That's like me saying uh, Adolf Hitler was a great leader and I can write a paper on that. And he was a great leader. He got tons of people to follow him. Now what he did, of course, that was awful. Yeah, and that's the same thing that goes on with Fidel Castro. Uh, and we both agree, Fidel Castro, 
like we're not saying that Ozzy was correct in saying that he loves Fidel Castro because obviously Ozzy even knows that that wasn't the correct way to say it. But like I said, he even said with being an English interview that he did that in, it's easier for him to express himself in his first language rather than English. And so it just got misconstrued. This text got taken out of context. And that's what happens with it. Baseball is almost through its first month, and some teams are just red hot. The Cardinals have started right where they left off, even with their all-star first baseman Albert Pujols leaving for the Angels this past offseason. So Carl, who do you think is a surprise for their start, and who do you think can keep it up? Well, I'm really glad that the Cards are pulling it out again. They're not missing Pujols at all. And uh, the pitching has been looking well, especially with Kyle Loesch. But uh, other teams that have been uh, at hot starts, I think, are the Texas Rangers, who we beat in the World Series, and uh, the LA Dodgers and the Washington Nationals, who I think the Nationals and a little bit of the Dodgers are a bit of a surprise. Yeah, they are really, especially when you look at it. Matt Kemp is starting off amazing, batting a 460 with nine home runs, and him and his teammate Andre Ethier have combined for 44 RBIs. That's more than the Pittsburgh Pirates as a team combined. That's amazing to think of the two together. So that's why LA's just been so hot. And then like you said, Kyle Loesch has been pitching great with a .99 ERA. Steven, Steven Strasburg for Washington Nationals pitching a 1.08 ERA. Those are really good numbers to start off with. The one team that I want to talk about just because they're also my favorite team, they're not on the graphic, but the White, Chicago White Sox have actually in my opinion, surprised most of the league. Uh, everyone saw them, at, especially this year, as being a complete rebuilding year. Uh, no no seen thoughts of being really good, no thoughts of being really great. And they're actually right up there with the top now as they won last night uh, at a 10-6 and six record now. They definitely are. They're hot right now, and they do have a great winning record. Now, it's a long baseball season. Honestly, I don't think any team can keep you know winning consistently this hot throughout the year. They'll have you know a down streak, but I do think you know some teams will come back and get things back in gear. You know, it when it comes down to it, it's going to come down to crunch time again. You saw what the Cardinals did last year; they weren't even supposed to make the playoffs, but they got hot and they made a run again. Every year it seems to be that way. You can be hot all season long, but if you do not get hot towards the end, then you're going to fall apart. We saw it with the NBA last year with the Dallas Mavericks. We see it, saw it last year with St. Louis Cardinals. I think it's going to continue again this year. To now it's be too speculating if we're going to say, oh, this team's going to make it to the playoffs World Series, but it's going to happen. The NFL draft is fast approaching, and all the talk has been focused on the top picks. But what about the sleepers? Possibly the biggest name in the NFL over the past few years has been Tom Brady. Tom Brady was a sleeper when he entered the draft. He was nowhere near a first-round pick. Who do you think the big sleeper will be in this year's draft? Uh, when it comes to the quarterback position, I'm not going to talk about that uh, a lot of especially with the quarterback position. There's a lot of good quarterbacks in this draft. I think I'm going to go to the wide receiver position, and the top guy that I think uh, when it comes to a sleeper is going to be Marvin McNutt from the University of Iowa. He's 6'3", 215 pounds. He's a big re wide receiver with pretty good speed. He's also average, got last year 1,315 yards receiving and 12 touchdowns in his senior year. Um, he's going to be a big wide receiver, big target for some quarterback in the league to get. He may not come out and be the greatest wide receiver next year. Might take him a year to develop to get part of the system. But I think he's going to come in next year and be a good 2-3 receiver to start off. A wide receiver that I actually picked was uh, Devier Posey. He, now a lot of people don't even know about him because he only played three games his senior year because of a suspension he suffered. And um, I just think that the guy, he needs the right kind of coaching because the suspension was from out of uh, athletic uh, con context, and he just needs you know the right environment and to be steered in the right direction. Now his junior and his sophomore year, he recorded over 800 yards. So I think that with the right environment, like I said, he can be a factor for a team. Yeah, we, actually, we obviously see natural talent with him. Uh, but last year, with only seeing him play in three games, it's hard for me to make an assessment if he's going to be that good in the, uh, the pros uh, because he only got 12 receptions total for 162 yards and two touchdowns. The team also went 0-3 during that stretch. So it's hard for me to say that he's going to be good. But if you look at the past two seasons, that is a good, big point. 
But another guy that I want to talk about that has some character issues that might be a big star but needs to go to that right program is Vontae's Buffett. He started off his sophomore year as second all all Pac-10, and as a freshman was defense, defensive freshman of the year. And he was projected to be an All-American this year. Turns around, has a pretty slim season with 69 tackles, only seven tackles for loss, interception, fumble recovery, off the field issues, slipped down to the late first round. We'll see where he goes after that. We're coming to the last part of our show where we get to introduce our buzzer beater. The UEFA Champions League is winding down in the second leg of the semifinals. In the past, how in the past the league has excuse me. The second leg of the semifinals begins today between Barcelona and Chelsea and will conclude tomorrow between Real Madrid and Bayern Munich. Before I came to the studio today actually, Barcelona and Chelsea were playing as we speak and Barcelona was winning 2 to 1 at halftime. Uh, Chelsea won the past the game in the the game in the first leg 1-0 which put them up, but now that Barcelona is winning, I think that the Spanish Giants, having their home at field advantage, are just going to pull out the win and they'll score another goal because before I got here, the game was at a 2-2 aggregate, but I don't think Barcelona can be stopped. Now tomorrow, I think Real Madrid will have the same thing. They're going to have the home field advantage and their away goal that they did have, they're just going to conquer Bayern Munich and they just won't stand a chance. And the final for the tournament will be another rematch between Real Madrid and Barcelona in the El Clasico. This past Saturday, Philip Humber threw MLB's 21st perfect game in its long history. The thing you might be wondering is, who exactly is Philip Humber? Well, one thing you might not know is he was actually taking number four overall pick right behind Justin Verlander in the 2003 draft. But his stats do not say anything like that. He's 11 and 10 in his MLB career with a 4.06 ERA with five different franchises. He's also most notably known as one of the prospects traded for Johan Santana from the New York Mets to, in that trade. But the one thing is that you talk about when it comes to Philip Humber is he's gone through a lot of issues through his short MLB career so far. He had Tommy John surgery before he even had his first uh, MLB start. Bounced around a lot in the triple A's and double A's. Didn't do much, got bounced around, put on waivers, Sox claim him last year. And he turns around and makes, gets, throws his perfect game in his first ever complete game in the MLB. Now that's just the amazing aspects of the MLB. There's some players that just come out and do things that you do not even expect them to do. One stat that also might come out and be a shock to you, Roger Clemens, Kurt Schilling, and Pedro Martinez never threw their own complete shutouts for perfect games. And that's just something that's going to be really great to remember. Phil Pummer will always go down in history as doing that against the Seattle Mariners. Thank you again for coming to our final episode of Clutch Time. I'm Jeremy Colder. And I'm Carl Farron.